Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Helena Lee. I am a children's eye doctor and a scientist working at the University of Southampton. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about albinism from the point of view of one of my patients. The patient that I have in mind is a little girl that I met a few years ago. She was about four or five years of age and wanted to grow up to be a princess, just like many other little girls her age. She was an absolutely gorgeous little girl with long blonde hair. And in fact, if you put her into a little blue ball gown, she would have looked exactly like Princess Elsa from Frozen. <laughs> However, she was also a very sad and anxious little girl. And this is because, due to her condition, her albinism, she was sight impaired. For her, this meant that when she was out in a crowd, she would struggle to find mum and dad because she couldn't see their faces clearly. She would struggle to cross the road. She struggled to read her bedtime story at night. And what really broke my heart one day was when she came into clinic and asked me for a letter to Disneyland Paris, where she was going on holiday, because she wanted to be at the front of the crowd for the Disney parade. All she wanted was to be able to see Princess Jasmine clearly. And I knew, well, I wasn't sure that she would ever be able to see Princess Jasmine clearly. What makes me even sadder is the knowledge that she faces a lifetime of discrimination in her schooling, in her work, and in her social life. All you have to do is look at how Hollywood portrays albino actors and actresses. How many of you have seen The Matrix Reloaded? Do you remember the twins from The Matrix Reloaded? Do you remember what they looked like and how they made you feel? They're blonde, they're tall, they're albino, and when they come out, you die. <laughs> yeah. This is the kind of stigma that albino people face every single day of their lives. And what's even worse is when you look at what's happening in Tanzania. Albino people in Tanzania live in fear of witch doctors who value their body parts, and unfortunately, children are no exception to this. This is why, in the modern era, it's completely unacceptable that we have not yet developed an effective treatment to improve vision for infants and young children with albinism. In fact, we've pretty much neglected many blinding childhood eye disorders, and this is completely unacceptable. So it's a bit depressing, but I think there is hope. I think there is a way to stamp out childhood blindness, and we've known about this probably as far back as the 16th century. So during the 16th century, which was about the time of the Reformation, some very clever people realized that they could treat something called lazy eye using patching and gossips. Now, everyone here probably knows someone with lazy eye, even if you don't realize it. It affects a lot of people, including celebrities like Heidi Klum and Ryan Gosling. And essentially, the problem with lazy eye is that your brain ignores the input from one eye. It just shuts down the input from that eye because the image from that eye is much more blurry compared to the other eye. And if you take an adult with this condition, they can't see in 3D. So if you have any friends that go with you to the cinema and they say they cannot see the 3D film, that's probably why. We have no way of treating adults with lazy eye, but children are completely different. Children have a very special ability to grow and change and adapt in response to different stimuli. So if you take a child and you give them glasses and patching, you can actually get their eyes to improve their vision. You can get their brains to recognize the input from that eye. And this is a concept that we call neuroplasticity. And that forms the core of my work, because I wonder why we aren't targeting this neuroplasticity in every other childhood eye condition. Why aren't we finding the right treatments and giving it at the right time and preventing blindness from happening in the first place? So, coming back to my little girl with albinism, what can I do for her? What is the equivalent of glasses and patching for her? And in order to understand this, we need to kind of figure out what the fundamental problem is. And I'm going to explain this exactly as I would explain this to the children coming to my clinic. So normally, there's an enzyme called tyrosinase, and you need this enzyme to convert amino acid called tyrosine, one of the basic building blocks of life, into your pigment, which forms your skin, hair, and eye color, as well as some other chemicals, some very important chemicals like L-dopa and dopamine, which are important for normal eye development and brain development. Think of your enzyme, your tyrosinase, as an electric mixer. Think of your tyrosine as your flower. In albinism, the problem is your electric mixer is malfunctioning, so you can't convert your flour into chocolate cake or biscuits. Okay? So, which of these elements, is it the pigment or the L-dopa or the dopamine that causes the problem? Which of those is my little magic bullet for curing blindness and albinism? And I think it is the chemical L-dopa. You will also be familiar with this. I watch a lot of movies. If you've seen The Awakenings <laughs> with Robert De Niro, Robin Williams, 
Yeah, so they use L-DOPA to wake up a group of catatonic victims of the 19, New York 1917 epidemic of encephalitis lethargica, which is sleepy illness. And the results are so dramatic, it just shows you how important L-DOPA is for the normal functioning of the brain. So I know for a fact that L-DOPA is needed for normal eye development. I also know that L-DOPA is missing in developing albino eye. So really, my theory is, why can't we use the L-DOPA to wake up vision in children with albinism? So this is what I've been working on for the last few years. So using funding from the Academy of Medical Sciences Starter Grant Scheme, I have actually tested the effects of L-DOPA supplementation in mice with albinism. Now, mice, with, mice can't read an eye chart. I, I'm a really good ophthalmologist. <laughs> I'm a really good mouse ophthalmologist, I just can't get them to read an eye chart. But I can actually measure the electrical signals coming from their eyes when I shine a light. So it can kind of give me an idea of how much they're able to see. And we call that an electroretinogram or ERG. So it's a bit like using an EEG to measure brain activity. And when I give these mice a 28-day course of L-DOPA, and they're drinking water, and they love the stuff. They really love the stuff. <laughs> and I give it to them before their 28 days of age, which is about two human years. Um, I get massive increases in the amount of electrical activity I'm reading from the mice. So this is very important, because this is the first time that we've proven that we can actually manipulate how the eye grows and develops in albinism and improve retinal function it suggests that we can actually develop a treatment for infants and young children with albinism. So, that's only step one. I have a long way to go to take this forward into the future. So in the next phase of my work, and this is work funded by the Medical Research Council in the study called, I called the Olivia study, which is actually after the first mouse I treated, who was called Olivia, and we are testing, <laughs> testing the effects of um, L-DOPA on retinal development and visual function when given at different doses and for different lengths of time. Once I've worked out what the best dose of L-DOPA is, our next step will be to move on to the first uh, clinical trials of L-DOPA treatment in albinism. Potentially, if, L -dopa, if, if Olivia is successful, it will transform how we treat albinism in children. It will also set an important precedent for the development of other, other novel therapeutics and other pediatric eye diseases. So my final message really is, what are we waiting for? We should be developing these treatments and we should be stamping out childhood blindness. <laughs>